dead. And I had, up until fairly recently, was I never really understood why it was that we never won the elections. We never won the elections because too many people have the wrong mindset. We have some people out there who says, who say, my Patty was a Democrat. My Manny was a Republican. I'm going to be a Republican or a Democrat. How many people know people of that mindset? A lot, right? There's a lot of those people out there. Then we have the people out there who say, I'm picking the candidate who is the lesser of two evils. What's the translation of that? The translation of that is, I choose to eat rat poison instead of gasoline. Am I right? How horrifying is that? And then we have the people who are making up our current society today in a vast majority. And that is, I vote for the candidate. The translation of that is, I vote for the person who's running who's going to give me mine. How many people here think that a government politician is going to give them theirs? Anybody? I hear crickets. I really do. I hear crickets are loud. Government will not give you yours. Government politicians will come out and they will say, yes, we're going to do this in your neighborhood. We're going to do that in your neighborhood. 25 years later, they're giving their campaign speeches saying, we're going to give you this in your neighborhood, we're going to give you that in your neighborhood. And it's the same thing they've been promising to give you for the past 25 years. There's a philosophical difference between people who believe in agorism versus the people who don't. Everybody here is a freedom-minded person. Everybody online who's watching is a freedom-minded person. You all have a completely different mindset from those people. I had a conversation with a statist not too long ago. And I'm going to briefly summarize the conversation. He knew that my business involves automobiles. And he said, okay, you want to replace the government. Well, would you replace a car if all you needed to do was change the light bulb? And I said, no, absolutely not. But that's not what we're talking about. If we're going to use that analogy, we're going to have to remember a few things about this. We're going to have to remember that this car, this government car, the frames rotted, the transmission's blown, the engine. We hear a loud rod knock, and the politicians who are responsible for the maintenance of this car keep pouring in water in the gas tank. They keep pouring in sand where the oil is supposed to go. Oh, by the way, we need another $1.5 trillion to pay for some more water and sand. Because really, if only we had more water and more sand, this car is going to run so much better, right? Oh, there's those crickets again. This encapsulation of that philosophy can be really seen if we look at this media theorist by the name of Douglas Rushkoff. Anybody here, Douglas Rushkoff? Anybody? No? In one of his articles promoted on CNN, he stated that we need to look at food and shelter as a basic human right. That way, we'll be free to make games for each other, we'll be free to share information, and, oh, by the way, to each according to his need, from each according to his ability. That's how it goes, right? <laughs> how many people like that here? Anybody? Crickets! Crickets! Okay, so how do we sell agorism to those people who have been conditioned 
that food and shelter is a basic human right. Is it possible? Does anybody here know of the magical sales pitch that's going to basically change? Oh, yes, we're going to live without government interference. And we all get to work for our meals, and we get to keep what we earn, because we're going to be producing. Wow. There really isn't a way to change that, because, well, that's what agorism is. We want to live without the government interference. We want to live, in short, surviving on our own abilities, producing, producing the best we can, taking the fruits of our labor. That's what we want. We don't want to be taken care of by some politician, by some politician's words. Government is failure. We don't have to pay to have government in our lives. We don't want to pay to have government in our lives. Lao Chi. Lao Chi is what this agorism conference was named after. And Lao Chi could be considered the father of agorism. Lao Chi teaches pretty much what I'm just saying, what everybody here believes. We all know these truths. And what do we do about this? How many people here have read Atlas Shrugged? <laughs> Lots of people have read Atlas Shrugged. Does anybody here remember when Mr. Thompson, the lead of the politicians in Atlas Shrugged, he asked Dagny Taggart, how do we solve the problems of our government today? He said, well, why don't you end taxes? What do you say to that? No, no, really. No, we can't possibly do that. But seriously, how do we solve the problems? They had John Galt. They had John Galt in front of the people, not really in chains, but with a gun on him. And they said, you're going to tell us. You're going to tell us all how to solve our problems. And what was his response? His response was to shout, Get out of my way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the government is in your way. I am John Gall. You are John Gall. Lao Chi is John Gall. Everyone in this room who has that entrepreneurial spirit, who has a work ethic, is John Gall. We see it. We see it in the people who do great things. Entertainers. ACDC. How many people are familiar with the band ACDC? <laughs> Lots of you. Come on, applaud. Applaud. They're great, right? ACDC came out with a song a long time ago entitled, It's a Long Way to the Top if You Want to Rock and Roll. Does anybody know that song? I'm a few bars. <laughs> Never mind. You don't want to hear me try and sing that song because yeah, I, I, I'm a terrible singer. I leave it to the professionals like ACDC. But one of the things ACDC says in that particular song, they did everything they possibly could to keep touring. They sold things secondhand. They did whatever it took to finance their trips around the country around wherever, just so they could keep playing, become, become great, become the band that was able to make a living off of playing rock and roll. That was their dream, and that was what they did. It didn't say in the song, it's a long way to the top unless you have a government handout. These people who play football on TV, those people didn't learn how to catch a ball with a government handout. The people that we see doing all sorts of great things in this world, none of them have had a government handout to become great. They became great because they had a dream and they worked hard to make it a reality. My suggestion
suggestion to everybody in this room who wants to sell Agorism, and everybody online who wants to sell Agorism, find those people that are already Agorists by nature. Your tradesmen, your plumbers, your hairstylists, all these people know that Agorism will only work with the people who believe in it. Del, Val Del Valley Silver. I just bought some silver today. <laughs> Del Valley Silver is a way to help promote Agorism in a way that they didn't at the shrug. We the people, we the producers, need to stop financing the failure that is government. Because the reality is, as you work earning Federal Reserve notes, you are being taxed. Your money is being taken from you to finance government failure. Is that right? No. Come on, I don't hear a loud is that. Is that right? No! Thank you! It's not right at all! We don't want to finance government's failure. We don't need government failure. Instead, take ourselves, our wares, our production out of the economy. We can find those people out there. We can find those people, farmers, who grow things, and pay them with silver. That farmer can pay a plumber to help work on his pipes, can pay the electrician to work on his wiring, can pay me, the mechanic, to fix his tractor, his cars. We all need these things. We don't need Federal Reserve rents to pay for them. We can pay for them amongst each other and stop financing the failure. Is that a good thing? Come on, is that a good thing? Yeah. Thank you. Stop financing your failure. Real quick, allow me, if you will, to take some questions. Come on, you gotta have a question or a comment. Are, are works projects ever a good thing for a society or economy, like infrastructure that um, I guess is available for public use? Okay, the question was, are works projects a good idea? Yes, they're a great idea. We can privatize them. We don't necessarily need the government to make a works project happen, right? If you need a bridge, and a lot of people need a bridge, you can finance the work on that bridge. When, when there was a problem with crime in Narstown, one of the projects that I worked on to help stop the crime was organizing a group of people to volunteer and labor. We cut back the forest where the criminals were hiding, throwing rocks at people and leaping out to abuse cyclists, runners, walkers, and steal their hard-earned hard -earned money. Uh, one more? Um, yeah, you mentioned earlier using gold and silver as currency, and I'm sure we're all in favor of that. But I recently uh, saw a report on County Massachusetts that uses foreign currency that was based on a reserve that was in Sierra, which is the county of Massport, and it seems to be working for them. Are you then open to the possibility of computer currency currency The question was, am I open to competing currencies? There was a town, where was it? Massachusetts. In Massachusetts who was selling or he's using their syrup as a currency instead of gold or silver. Absolutely. I think the more the merrier. As long as we have a standard of value, as long as people are willing to say, okay, I'll work four hours for that syrup, or however much for that syrup, then as long as everybody's in agreement, then I don't see any problem with it. Mr. Crawshot, sir. What about the children? How, what? Would, you, how would you sell a tourism when it comes to children? To be quite honest with you, the, be the beauty of Agorism and Agorist society is it makes room for competing societies. It makes room for socialism. It makes room for communism. If somebody wants to be a communist or a socialist, they can be a communist or a socialist. 
We just don't want to pay for it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, children in an agora society will be taken care of by agoras. How many people here in this room as agorists would want to see their children suffer? Anybody? Do we hear those crickets again? Yes. We hear crickets. <laughs> Any more questions? Any comments from the up there? They're not talking. They're not talking. The Baxter is down on the job. You're live. I am live. So nobody's actually saying anything. Oh well. I've actually been having a conversation with somebody on there. For some reason, uh, the computer that is on the screen is not getting uh, good signal. Well, anybody say anything? Um, Outstanding. I'm trying to save my battery. Is there anything over there in the top right? Yes, right over here. But why don't we just use a barter system instead of having some sort of coin or paper or something? That's. The question was, why don't we have a barter system? Well, the gold and silver trade, or the syrup trade, is actually partly, it's part of that barter system. We're exchanging value for value. If, say, for example, you have a ware or a service that whoever it is that you're bartering with doesn't have something that you need, they can give you silver. <coughs> Bless you. They can give you silver in exchange, and that way, they're still giving you value for value. Does that make sense? Yeah. Question? I mean, yeah, I, I don't understand um, about the gold and silver thing, because yeah, gold and silver back in the 1800s, gold was produced in the mine, and people generally had access to it. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays, Gold and silver mines are controlled by corporations, which is Wall Street. The, uh, the gold, the mine gold, is basically controlled by the big banks. The, the majority of the gold is then in like these, these large entities, corporate stuff. So, uh, you know, we, so I don't understand why we still want to try to use gold and silver because where are we going to get it from? We're going to get it from the very Places that we're trying to shut down, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't connect. Okay, the question was the gold mines and the silver mines, they're all controlled by big government entities and big corporate entities. And how is it that we can survive by how do we obtain gold and silver in order to do our trading and whatnot? Well, simply put, gold and silver right now is controlled by the market, the price of gold and silver. For example, I just I just paid 33 bucks for an ounce of silver because that's what the market's bearing at the moment. And you can buy your silver from Del Valley Silver right over here. But basically the point is you buy some some silver and you start spending it with people who are willing to take it in exchange for goods or services. You use it in, in lieu of money. Does that make sense? It is money. In lieu of, yeah. in, I'm sorry. Yeah. In, lieu of, in lieu of what we are paying for. In lieu of the Federal Reserve notes. Now you're talking. Thank you. Sorry. So in other words, gold and silver, maple syrup, uh, bartering, the same thing. Yes. Yes. Oh. It's all the same thing. Only we're not giving a cut. To the federal government so it can continue on its failed policy. Yes? But who will build the roads? <laughs> we just went over that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. He's in the bathroom. The question was who will build the roads? <laughs> we will build the roads. How many people here know someone in construction? Come on, put your hands up. Everybody knows somebody in construction. I know at least a half dozen people in construction. As a matter of fact, I just bought a table saw from somebody in construction. Did a website for a guy. Did a website for a guy. Anyway, we have a chorus who are willing to do, who are willing to bid on these projects. And more than likely, if they're able to buy their materials, 
from someone who's willing to take silver for their materials, they will probably do the, the job in exchange for silver. This is how it works. We work on this together as a community. We grow this community. And when people start to see that a community of greedy entrepreneurs who don't want to contribute their fair share to the government failed projects, they'll either choose to opt out themselves or the government will just simply implode because it won't be able to afford these failed projects because, well, we're not playing anymore. John Gall, in the book Atlas Shrugged, took the producers and more or less, more or less, they all went on strike. They stopped contributing to the failed government policies. And what happened in the book? The government imploded. When the government imploded, they all came back and rebuilt the world. Or at least that's how the book ended. The original. So, the original. <laughs> Pardon. Ken Kralchuk wrote Atlas Snub, which gave of what happened afterwards. And his book is very well written. Very well written and should be read by everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take my silver. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? I was reading about Mexican creation, where basically very uh, local conflict, say, on Mexican creation, they require you to sell off all your real estate holdings, get the sink in, sink worth you up to $2 million, <coughs> and then the rest they get. What are the pitfalls if you do that? The question is, what are the pitfalls of expatriation? Wow. I wish I had an answer to that question. I honestly don't know. Uh, we have one gentleman by the name of George Donnelly who would probably have more information on that. He's watching now. I'm not sure. He might, he might come up with an answer as the day goes by. Any more questions? Chip, are there any questions off the way? My question is, um, let's say that we came to fail the policies with fiat dollars and everything, and while that's true, um, would you say it's as simple as maybe going back to a commodity standard or a large system when, for the first time in history, our fiat currency is a reserve currency as well, so we're kind of responsible for bringing it not to the economy of the world in? Um, what, what do we do with that responsibility uh, as far as other countries? Okay, the question is, our fiat currency is the currency of the world. And if we decide to move to a barter system and more or less end what's happening right now with our fiat currency, won't we be responsible for the downfall of the economies of the world? Currently, the economies of the world are already trashed. We look at Greece, uh, the only place that's really expanding at an economic level is China. And China had to use slave labor, yes? I would say, but my, before I get to my question, I feel that because we were a reserve currency, that crashing is a result of us crashing, and that's why we're crashing fast, because they have to convert, you know, say, two million francs to get a million dollars to pay for gas and international trade. So I would, you know, we, we become responsible through our failed currency policy for the down. As the way I understand it, other countries are are more or less trying to adopt a currency that more or less sidesteps the dollar. They're maybe going to create a global currency, a global fiat currency, which is going to make things just so much better. And uh, with regard to backlash against the United States. We're already experiencing the backlash against the United States. We have countries who are more or less destroying us economically. China, for example, their economy is growing primarily because they have slave labor. And that's always good if you want to have a growing economy to have slave labor. So, did I answer your question okay? In the transition to an agro system, what would happen to our uh, countries no 
military facilities or properties or like nuclear power plants, like liabilities, dangerous things like that, like what would actually would there would there be any way to transition in a way that it wouldn't be like mass destruction with you know misappropriation of like nuclear waste, nuclear plants, weapons? The question was, what about the military? What about nuclear plants? If we transfer to an Agor society, won't this be a big, huge problem? I don't necessarily see it as a big, huge problem because the only way I see us transitioning to an Agor society is little by little. People like us who are interested in giving value for value we will make small little agorist communities <clears throat> and more or less these things will work themselves out i believe as time goes by yes didn't the government just report that they lost 16,000 kilograms of weapons grade uranium 16,000 how many kilograms kilograms of highly enriched uranium of highly enriched weapons grade uranium our government which we pay, wow. Could we do worse than that? <laughs> Could we do worse than losing 16,000 kilograms of weapons grade uranium? That's the same as I don't necessarily believe that to be possible. <laughs> Only if you're looking. That's very true. Only if you're looking. It's a huge volume. It's an absolutely huge volume. My guess is somebody wrote something wrong on a piece of paper and it's really not missing. It might be in a bunker somewhere that somebody forgot. About. As uncomfortable as I might be with the government having the uh, power and authority to to track these things. Okay. Who would track these things in agro society? Like who would be able to say this must be missing? Like of uh, if if it was all privatized, I can I can see that after it's all privatized. But with the current situation where we have these stockpiles that aren't privatized, like who who would take responsibility for that? Well the question is who would take responsibility for these big huge stockpiles of nuclear weapons? and weapons grade uranium that seem to go missing when the government's in control of it. My suggestion is there is a beautiful opportunity for a business. <laughs> Sir, I suggest you research it and start one up. We'll call it the how to handle the stockpiles of enriched uranium corporation. <laughs> Dot com. Dot com. I'll donate. <laughs> okay. So my time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a thrill to give my speech here at Agora Lao Chi. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Agora's I.O. Unconference. Woo! Who's about the fifth speaker? We should know what we're doing by now. We are live from the Valley Forge Beef and Ale in beautiful downtown Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. We are listening to a whole series of lively libertarian speakers, over 100 of them on two channels. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention all of our grateful sponsors. They include AMCAP Entrepreneur Network, Center for a Stateless Society, Cop Block, Freedom's Phoenix, Free Team, Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, and WeWonFly.com. Our next speaker is Nicholas Shankin. Nick is a rising star in the Philadelphia Freedom Movement. He is the organizer of the Philadelphia Tyranny Response Team and the founder of the Operation Trash the Curfew, a grassroots response the martial law being imposed on the youth of Philadelphia by their tyrannical mayor. His, the topic of his talk is Operation Trash the Curfew. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Schenken.
Well, I'm really glad that I could. Oh, I'm really glad that I could follow up Ron Carter earlier in uh, talking about the notion of the police state because uh, I think I'm going to get a little bit more specifically into what that constitutes, at least within the Philadelphia area. Uh, I was invited today to discuss my involvement with the charity response team, which is a nonprofit activist group that's based out of Philadelphia, but more specifically my involvement with Trash the Curfew, which uh, Jim and I co-founded together. Um, I first heard about the charity response team through the local circuit of activist events, things like the Fed rallies, the Lemonade Freedom Stands, and so on and so forth. And I was invited to join the group by Michael Heiss, who is actually here today. Good for him. Um, what stuck out to me about the group was the devotion of its members and the contributions that they provided on a day-to-day -day basis. Everybody in the group seemed to uh, constantly be sharing posts with each other, research findings, opinions, and sort of share a sense of devotion that I hadn't seen in other groups that I had worked with. Eventually, after realizing that we had a, a devoted like fan base and people who wanted to work with us, I decided to start my own campaign and try to start organizing some events. So I came up with the blueprint for a few ideas, and uh, I didn't really know where to go in terms of uh, who should help me organize this. So I contacted Jim Babb to sort of get some feedback and see what he thought about it. Yay. And uh, he had a lot of ideas. <laughs> he told me that his focuses were primarily on the issue of the stop and frisk policy enacted by Mayor Nutter in Philadelphia that allows the police to warrantlessly search you for basically any terms that they deem uh, worthy and the issue of the curfew that had been imposed to address the problem of flash mobs within the city. So I did some homework on the subject, and the facts seemed to speak for themselves. Concerning first the stop and frisk policy, I have I found this regarding. It was enacted by Mayor Nutter in 2008 after he had declared a prime emergency in the city of Philadelphia. By 2009, less than a year later, the police had stopped and searched 253,333 pedestrians, 72% of whom were African American. Could this possibly be racial profiling? 81% of these stops led to an arrest, often for quote unquote criminal conduct that was entirely independent from the supposed reason for the search. Mayor Nutter's spokesman, Mark McDonald, had this to say about it. Police abuse claims have remained flat while the searches have more than doubled in their frequency, as if this is a good thing. By the way, all this information comes from a Philly.com report called U.S. Lawsuit Targets Philly's Stop and Frisk Policy. Apparently, the ACLU and a uh, private legal firm have decided to sue the mayor for this. But Philadelphia was hardly an innovator of this tactic. Actually, we saw this policy enacted previously in New York in 2006. Back then, 500,000 vehicles and pedestrians were stopped, 89% of whom were not Caucasian. Whites were 70% more likely to have a weapon, and yet still we see this sort of racial profiling being carried out by these policemen conducting searches. The factors for potential searches, and this remains true in Philadelphia as well, include having a previous criminal record, being in a high crime area, engaging in evasive conduct under you know, whatever that could be. Furtive gestures, flight from police. I know I personally tend to avoid the police, but apparently doing so is now uh, criminal activity. And uh, previous information obtained from police bulletins, or basically anything that they could possibly want to search you for. Vehicles may also be frisked and searched, but are limited to grab hole areas where a weapon could be placed or hidden, including closed but not locked containers. I'd like to stress to you the importance of noting the racial undertones in these searches and considering for a moment who, speaking on terms of minorities, these searches actually affect the most. But I'd like to digress a little bit and draw some comparisons between the stop and frisk policy and the curfew. The curfew itself was enacted on August 12th in 2011 after um, a series of flash mobs had been conducted as announced by Mayor Nutter and imposed upon the citizens of Philadelphia. <clears throat> Within an hour and a half of the curfew's passing, more than 50 children had been arrested in the city of Philadelphia. According to the mandate of the curfew, anybody under the age of 13 must be indoors by no later than 10 p.m., and anyone under the age of 18 must be in by no later than midnight. And according to the curfew, no one under the age of 18 is allowed downtown whatsoever, downtown, after 9 p.m. The 
first offense of a curfew violation results in a $300 fine, but uh, the parents of the children can be fined up to $500 for repeated offenses. The parents can also be forced to serve up to 90-day jail sentences for their child's repeated offenses and are liable for any damages to either people or uh, property. If the parents don't answer the phone call from the police after the child has been taken to the station, the Department of Human Services is contacted and an, an investigation is conducted immediately as to whether or not the child should be removed from the household. And yet, despite all of these measures, the most startling fact that I uncovered was that only four of the 11 flash mobs actually took place after the hours of the curfew restrictions. It was passed for only a short time initially, but then it was extended until after Labor Day, a day which has since come and gone. And uh, it has since been stated that it is going to remain in place until the law can be rewritten. So Jim and I decided sort of that the curfew was kind of like an umbrella issue. It sort of encompassed everything that we oppose. Uh, basically, the restriction of individual liberties, the takeover of government, um, the, the irrationality of proposing a short-term solution for problems that are really much more long-term in scope. <clears throat> we came up with the idea for the project, which developed into an, under hour, an underage after-hours trash pickup that would not only demonstrate civil disobedience in the community, but would also do so in a manner that was both positive and beneficial to the community so that our message might be better received. Our mission statement reads as follows. Trash the Curfew, a nonprofit collaboration of community activists based within the greater Philadelphia region, seeks to redress the oppressive curfew laws imposed by the city's mayor, Michael Nutter, focusing instead on finding proactive solutions to the city's persisting issue of violent crime. The goals of its operations are not only to preserve the unalienable constitutional rights of every member of the community, regardless of age, race, gender, sexual orientation, or otherwise, but also to engage the city's youth to resist the temptations of violence and criminality and to instead embrace methods of peaceful, positive, and productive engagement within the city so that their voices may be both heard and well received. Employing the principles of peaceful resistance and civil disobedience, the group operates youth-based after-hours trash collection events throughout the city in order to encourage the people of Philadelphia to resist the restrictions of the curfew and to serve as a positive example to the community's youth. The operations are conducted in the efforts of preserving both the constitutional rights of each and every resident of Philadelphia and the adherence of their beloved city and to help facilitate the conditions necessary to improve the well-being of its neighborhoods, strengthening interpersonal relationships and promoting open discussion between Philadelphians as they unite beneath the common goal of freedom. We resist the restriction of individual liberties, acknowledging instead the need to address the causes of crime within the city. We wish not to cause a commotion within the city, but instead to provide a clear and peaceful voice of reason founded on the principles of peace and individual liberty. We reject the status quo and seek to engage members of the community from all walks of life to be the peaceful deliverers of the change they wish to see. I thought at first that I would have a lot of support and a lot of backing for this event, but I was a little disheartened to find that I had far more opposition than I had previously planned for, from both civilians and libertarians and members of the liberty movement alike. There are three crime oppositions to my stance on this issue that I often occur and I would like to address them today. The first argument I hear is that the curfew is actually working to solve the issue of the crime or that it is somehow beneficial to the community. The second is that most people grew up in small suburban towns that already had curfews in place for underage, uh, underage members of society. And the third is the question of what I personally propose to do about the violence and why I'm not just protesting the flash mobbers altogether. I'll respond to them in order. My response to the first point is that the curfew hasn't really been in place for long enough to safely say that it's working. Since we didn't have flash mobs every day, one month of a curfew is really no safe basis to state that the curfew is actually solving the issue of the flash mobs at all. And on that note, for how much longer should we bother to keep the curfew? Should we just keep it forever and just get rid of the entire notion of flash mobs? Couldn't the children have daytime flash mobs instead? I'd like to remind you that four of the 11 flash mobs actually took place before the hours of the curfew. What happens if, each, if these children grow up in a society that restricts their individual freedoms and they grow to resent this oppression? Could something potentially worse brew because of this and result as these, uh, these resentments come to a boiling point? Should we just make the curfew 24 hours a day altogether and keep the kids off the streets until the age of 18 when they suddenly become reasonable and safe enough to allow them to roam, freely roam the streets? 
how can somebody draw such distinctions in this situation, either right. through law policy or well, any other means? Yes. I think that the curfew is merely a short-term solution to the issue of crime. Just because we're keeping the kids off the streets doesn't mean that we're solving the causes of the criminal behavior in the first place. We need instead to address the conditions for this inner city crime concentration rather than ignoring it. Furthermore, the curfew is simply unconstitutional. We all have the right to secure our own persons and to travel freely. Either we have a constitution or not, and if not, I feel as though there should be some sort of formal announcement of tyranny, and then perhaps we could act for a response from there. <laughs> To respond to the second point that I most often encounter when dealing with my opposition, that many grew up with local curfews in their communities. I, for one, also grew up with a curfew, and yet still I oppose it, so I don't really see the logic for such an argument. Just because an unjust law has been in place for a long time, does it then become just? Consider the institution of slavery. Many people grew up with it for generations and generations, but did this make it just? Apparently not, since we decided to do away with it. The same goes for segregation after slavery was abolished. Many people grew up with that, and yet still the civil rights movement of the 1960s did away with that as well. Consider also the Patriot Act. Nearly everybody that I talk to on the street opposes it, and yet it's nearly 10 years old. Somebody who's been born since then is now old enough to speak and to say, well, I just grew up with it, but does this actually make it just? I would argue that an unjust law is no law at all, and that is why we found it to trash the curfew. In response to my third point, the issue of the violence and why I'm not just out protesting the criminals who uh, have been engaging in the flash mobs, I'd like to say first of all that I'm not protesting the flash mobs because the violent kids who have been causing them, first of all, probably wouldn't care if I did, wouldn't take notice if I did, and it wouldn't really change much without this kind of systems reform and the sort of work from the ground up that Philadelphia needs to do to prevent the conditions that breed the crime. And in the words of Jim, on a humorous note, there's only one side of the situation, man and art. <laughs> to readdress the previous statement regarding the conditions that actually breed the crime, I'd like to elaborate on what I think the contributing factors are. First of all, we have the drug war between the police and so-called criminals, though we all know that they are engaging in victimless crimes. We have welfare and social institutions that breed the conditions, the conditions for laziness and unemployment in these, uh, these areas of town. Thanks. We have the public education system and the many faults and poor funding that it receives through theft, otherwise known as taxation. And we have the police instigation that results as, uh, as a result of all of these conditions in these high crime areas and the subsequent racket that arises from this. Concerning the drug war, <laughs> I found a report entitled The Past and Future of U.S. Prison Policy, published by two doctors by the name of Honey and Sam. Again, we see these instances of racial profiling as a primary motive for these arrests, and the statistics have this to say. At the beginning of the 1990s, the U.S. had more African-American men between the ages of 20 to 29 years old under control of the justice system than in college. The authors had this to say, and this is a direct quote, pardon the term, ghetto. Crime policies are a major contributor to the disruption of the family, the prevalence of single-parent families, and children being raised without a father in the ghetto, and of the inability of people to get the jobs that are still available. According to their statistics, an estimated 5.3 million Americans, or one, roughly one out of every 41 adults, have currently or permanently lost their right to vote as of 2010 for drug-related incidents. <clears throat> 1.4 million African American men, or roughly 13% of the African American population, have, are since disenfranchised for such felonies, which is seven times the national average. 676,730 women are now ineligible to vote due to some sort of felony charges, generally drug related, and three out of every 10 African American men in the next generation will be disenfranchised for similar charges. Between the years 2002 and 2005, 5% of all stock drivers were searched. Males were more likely to be searched, specifically African American males at a rate of 9.5%, and Hispanic males at a rate of 8.8%. Yet whites suffered only a 3.6% rate of search, even though, as I mentioned before, they were 70% more likely to be carrying a weapon. <laughs> but what happens next in a single parent inner city home? after the father has been removed from the household because of some sort of drug violation or other. We have government welfare assistance. Poor people are crowded into state designated areas where their housing is literally paid for with tax dollars from the working class. 
Many of these children grow up without seeing their parents work a single day in their lives, at least not legally, but this doesn't mean the parents aren't working now. In order to keep their welfare, of course, they must turn to the black market, a symptom of any historically unstable economy. Time and time again, as economic systems have collapsed, we've seen a tendency for people to turn towards black market or other criminal measures as a means of making a living. We have women's assistance that allows for far more children to be afforded than would have otherwise been. Than would have otherwise uh, been able to be raised in such a household. And then the children receive inadequate parenting at home. After that, they go to school, but what, what happens in the schools? The teachers who these, uh, these children must be educated, quote unquote, by, dread their jobs in these inner city areas and have little faith in their students. Those that manage to last in the teaching system are then granted teacher's tenure after tenure and can simply stop teaching if they so wish to. And why wouldn't they with no incentive to work? Would you keep bothering to maintain quality standards if you knew that you couldn't get fired and that your pay would not only be inconsistent but have the potential to increase? They're guaranteed a permanent position in the system and they are going to work every day teaching a student body that simply doesn't care. By privatizing education and abolishing the entire notion of public school taxes, we could allow for competition in school, similar to colleges and the way that they operate. These schools could compete for an academic reputation and not only that, but affordability of services, and the parents could afford private education with the money that they've saved from the taxes that would have otherwise been spent on public schools. <coughs> public schools could be an option if they could compete in such a system, but like through a, a funding system of voluntary taxes, but they would probably fizzle out in such a competitive economy in favor of private education. But still, the system remains as it is, so what happens after that? These children, raised in single-parent, non-working houses with parents who are likely to be engaging in black market deals and who go to schools with poorly funded tax materials, taught by teachers who don't care, have no reason to care, and can't get fired, are then exposed to the police circuit. These police patrol these inner city areas, whereas we've seen in the statistics, they conduct racially motiva motivated searches and profiling and arrest these children for things as simple as curfew violations. These kids grow to distrust the police and the authorities if they weren't already raised to by their parents. And they turn from legal behaviors in favor of more backdoor, under the table dealings. The police in instigate conflicts between the citizens and they make their arrests and they prey upon these people and the state makes its money and the curfew only aids this. And the, the use of violence and, the, and coercion to obtain state funding just perpetuates itself. The use of force and violence is then made even more necessary for the police to use. And after all, wasn't the curfew put in place to end the violence? Or is it just citizen violence rather than police violence? Why don't we just take the guns out of the room, the tax guns that fund education and welfare systems that are clearly failing us, the police guns that are abusing our citizens and breeding distrust of the authorities, and rightly so, and the drug war guns that are putting people in jail for victimless crimes? If these sort of like Section 8 housing programs didn't exist, concentrating these impoverished people wouldn't be a possibility, and the wealthy might actually want to move in and gentrify these areas and improve their conditions. But until this sort of government-sponsored freeloading is put to a stop, this will never happen. I'd like to remind you that it's not the government's job to keep the children indoors or out of trouble. It is the sole responsibility of the parents. Why don't we let the fathers come home from prison and make them work because in a free society they would have to in order to make a living. I'd like to re-emphasize the importance of home life and family connections. The only true solution to the, uh, to the situation is a, a more positive upbringing and adequate parental guidance. These children need the tools to make decisions for themselves and in a free society they would probably be able to maintain them. We need to work from the bottom up rather than the top down to make these necessary changes. But first, we've got to spread the word, which is why I co-founded Trash the Curfew with Jay. These changes won't happen overnight, but restricting liberties to keep the children in won't solve anything. You can't slap a band-aid on a broken leg and call it fixed, and the curfew is an example of this. Not only this, but it's the first step to tyranny. Everybody tells me, oh, it's okay, it's just the children. Only the children are being restricted right now. But if the policymakers can restrict the children's freedoms, then you can bet that they can sure do it to the adults as well. And by then, could it be too late? But the reality is this. 
that the, the government of Philadelphia is telling its citizens that they cannot leave their homes. Can you understand the potential ramifications of this? But we are here to oppose it, not to dwell on the reality of the situation. We intend to do this through methods of civil disobedience and in a peaceful and productive manner, similar to uh, the efforts of Gandhi, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., and other freedom fighters throughout the ages. We think that the trash pickup is a great example of this because the children will be breaking the unjust law while giving back to the community and providing an excuse and sort of form of protection for the protesters. If you were a police officer, could you arrest a child for breaking the curfew if he's cleaning up the litter in the community? We'd like to send a message that children not only care, but can also do good things at any hour of the night, and in doing so, and by doing so, in conducting our operations, strengthening the bond of community individuals as they discuss their views on these issues and come together beneath the common goal of freedom. Trash the Curfew will meet for its first operation at 10 o'clock p.m. on Saturday, October 1st, at the intersections of Broad and South Street. We'll march eastward, cleaning up trash, and when we finish, there will be an after party at John's Bar and Grill in North and South. We pick the location because it's not only child friendly, but the adults can also drink if they want to, and on top of that, it's openly, and we are conducting after hours activities. We're doing all we can, but we still need your support and ideas to make Trash the Curfew a success. Please go to trashthecurfew.com to submit your ideas and print flyers for distribution, or like us on Facebook and invite all of your friends to the event. We are hoping to have a very large turnout and hopefully conduct more operations in the future, at least until the curfew has been lifted. We're positive about the turnout and excited to see it unfold, and we're excited about the positive changes to the community that we think that our campaign is going to bring. Um, that's really all I have to say in the matter. Are there any questions or comments? Um, I have two things, actually. Um, I was just wondering if there's any concrete plan set down for a date for the public education that I'll be presenting for this. Yeah, October 1st. October 1st. Yeah, Saturday, October 1st at 10 o'clock. Okay, and um, the other thing is, I kind of want to take note of uh, uh, kind of self uh, self promotion. Um, Aren't and there two witness at events planned for this month in Philly? Oh, this one hasn't even been announced yet because me and Dan here and all us as far as mm -hmm. we should go during the week or the weekend, that kind of thing. But um, uh, yeah, there is a couple I forget the date, but if you go to, uh, if you search for Philly Care Response Team, you can find those dates on Facebook. But um, yeah, anybody who, who agrees that the you know, Federal Reserve is the big threat for economic children is um, going to have to join you know, New York and Philadelphia uh, end of February, like sometime at the end of November. <coughs> and hopefully, in time, we have to spread it to other cities. So, so I got off topic. Could you repeat what he says? Because the online audience can't hear. Oh, okay. Uh, he was discussing, first of all, he asked me uh, when we would actually be needed to engage in our operations. And then he said that he was uh, in the works developing plans for a joint effort between New York and Philadelphia to host an NSA event and, I guess, draw public attention to the cause that the Federal Reserve is the root of our problems, which it is. <laughs> Jim and I talked about setting up some sort of workshop in inner city areas to uh, educate people about, the, children specifically, about their rights concerning police um, and their, uh, their liberties like in such a situation that they would be searched or arrested. Um, at this point, I have neither the funding nor the actual planning, plans in place to do so, but it's something that we're considering. Hmm? Does anybody know the average age of the members of the trash mobs? Um, I don't know. I think it would be safe to bet that many of them are over the age of 18, and many of them are also under the age of 18. Mob psychology is a powerful thing, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were some people between, you know, 25 and up out there. Mm. I remember reading the 17th sentence quote that you mentioned. If that was in the U.S. as a whole, that would be clear evidence of the racist profiling. Well, we've got to Philadelphia, where 
and the US. percent of the population is black. <laughs> and I suspect we're talking about areas where this went on where most likely 72% of the population is black, 72% of the people walking on the street, 72% of the people eligible to be stopped mm. are black. I think it's very dangerous to make the argument that you were making and others were making at the time well, that it's evidence of racism when it's really just a demographic accident and that that's Philadelphia. I was under the impression that um, Caucasians were in the majority in Philadelphia. Perhaps I was mistaken. Exactly. But they definitely not the majority blacks. Definitely have the plurality. I'm not sure. Well, the, the Hispanic and Asian. Uh, I think it's a pretty staggering statistic that in New York, of the 500,000 people, stop 89% of them were white. I mean, even if, uh, even if, um, you, you said 89% were white? Yeah, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, we're not white. Um, so if 89% if of 500,000 searches were conducted to racial minorities, I think that's a pretty staggering statistic. Yeah, so that you even in Philadelphia, where you can walk, and less than one in ten of the people will be white. I don't know New York as well, but I think ten would be quite a bit of the case there. Philadelphia does not represent the U.S. about demographics here. New York is in no way an American city as far as demographics goes. That's something to consider. There, there, there are parts of New York City, parts of Philadelphia, which are white, but the police don't go there. Well, that was my point, though, that it, a racket had subsequently arisen from this. When you have police going into these more crime concentrated areas, these inner city areas, you know, they're not going to the like uh, say written house as much conducting random searches. They're going out to Kensington and various other shadier parts of the city. But I wanna uh bring up Jim's question because he's in the circuit. Um, isn't it wrong to basically shake down someone no matter what their race is, just based on where they are? Absolutely. What their Absolutely. potential age might be and furtive and gestures and uh, yeah, fleeing from the police or whatever. Yeah, they can basically search you for whatever they want and uh, make up the grounds to do so. Uh, what is a furtive gesture? <laughs> furtive gesture. I would assume uh, something like, you know, who knows? Like you're trying to, like you're trying to hide something. Yeah, maybe, or uh, that you were somehow threatened, or yeah, I, I would say that you're hiding something. That would be a good, a good description. Thanks for having me. It's always good to see the youth coming up to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. Ready? Okay. All right. I'd like to welcome you to the second of course unconference. <laughs> We are live in the Valley Forge Beef and Ale in beautiful downtown Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. My name is Ken Krawchuk. I'm your MC today. This is one part of the Great Agorist IO Unconference where we have over 100 exciting libertarian speakers. We've had certainly our share of them today, and it's not over yet. Our next speaker is Rob. Oh, before I get to Rob, I almost forgot our sponsors. Can't forget the people who made this possible. The ANCAP Entrepreneur Network. Center for a Stateless Society, Cop Block, Freedom's Phoenix, Free King, Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, and WeWon'tFly.com. Thanks to our sponsors. <laughs> and the motorcycle's outside. <laughs> now we come to the reason that the sponsors of General Generously donated their motorcycles. Tired. Our next speaker is Rob Fernandez. Rob is a voluntarist who follows the non-aggression principle. He promotes freedom through education, freedom and liberty through education. He founded Lemonade Freedom Day in Philadelphia and elsewhere to encourage parents and children to question and disobey arbitrary laws. 
He and his wife, Carolina, homeschool their two children in New Jersey. And Robert is a manager for a financial firm in New Jersey. Please join me in welcoming the stage, Robert Hendricks. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here today to speak about raising free-thinking, disobedient children and why it's so important to raise children. Uh, basically, if you uh, look at the definition of obedience, what is obedience? It's to obey orders. And that's, that's basically all it is. So you can pretty much get the idea of why it's such a bad thing to have obedient children. Um, you know, but if you go in Barnes and Nobles and in different bookstores, if you go online, you'll see nothing but books about how to raise obedient children, uh, which is exactly why I came up with the, the idea for the, the presentation today to uh, talk about raising disobedient children. Um, so, so why is obedience such a bad thing? Um, aside from, you know, the, the whole, you know, complying with, with just, just uh, arbitrary orders, there's also the, the, a few other issues. The safety of the children. Um, I mean, if, if you look at, for example, sexual assaults on children, uh, most sexual assaults are done by people that they know or friends of the family. So a, a child that's, that's taught to obey orders and only obey orders and to respect their elders and to listen to what, what everybody tells them, they're going to be a lot less likely to tell somebody to stop and to tell somebody no and to stop them from doing what they're doing. Um, whereas a child who's more of a free-thinking child, who's, who's, who has, you know, who's able to, you know, uh, critical, crit critical thinking child, is, is much more likely to, you know, tell somebody like that to stop. Um, so, you know, aside from that, it's, it's you know, it's, it's beneficial to society, as, you know, I'm going to get in later. Uh, so where is obedience learned? Um, one of the main places, as you all probably know, is in school. Um, the, the first thing that you're taught when you go in school is to comply. You know, sit down in class, um, listen to the listen to what the teachers tell you, do everything they tell you to do, uh, participate. Even if you don't want to participate, now you have to participate. You know, participate for the time set that you're in my class. If I'm the teacher and you come into my class, you know, you're you're expected to participate for that time. And even if it's something that you're not interested in, you have to participate. And if it's something that you are interested in, then as soon as that bell rings, you have to just disassociate yourself with everything. So it teaches you also uh, not to follow through with things and not to get too attached to different things that you're doing. Um, so it's, so it's, it's, it's really a whole mental game that, that, that's going on with kids in school. You know, come into my class, uh, participate, you know, be active, be interested, learn, but turn that off as, as soon as that bell rings. Uh, you know, there, there's there's other things. You know, permission. You know, you have to ask. You know, the authority the authority figure for permission to do everything. You have to go to the bathroom. You ask for permission. You want to talk. You ask for permission. You know, basically just just shut up. Don't talk unless you're spoken to. You know, it, it basically teaches you. Uh, you know, to obey authority. You know, flawlessly. Um, also, self confidence. Uh, you know, when when you when you have a test and when you take a test. That the teacher grades your test. So your confidence is going to be based on the grade that was given to you by the teacher and not the work that you actually did, the, the work that you put into the test or the project. So instead, the teacher will be judging you, and your self-confidence will be based 100% on what that teacher told you. So if, if the teacher gave you an A, you're going to feel good about yourself. If the teacher gave you a C, you're not going to feel so good about yourself. So it, 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 it takes out the, the personal uh, self-responsibility and, 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 and being able to determine whether you did well or not, and it puts all your emotions and, and all of your self-confidence based on the opinion of another person. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it also, uh, the grades also make you rely on an expert. You know, if you don't know that you did good, you know, you need the expert, the teacher, to tell you that you did good. So, you know, you can see how that relates to society today as well where, you know, we have so many people that they can't make decisions for themselves and they have to rely on experts for everything. And, and you know, that's why we feel like we need politicians and, and different people to control our lives for us and to make decisions for us because, you know, we don't have the capacity. We don't have that title uh, behind our name. So, you know, we, we just don't have the, the, ex the expert label that, that these politicians do. 
um, you know, and, and a lot of these issues are brought up in uh, uh, by John John Taylor Gatto. He uh, he wrote something called the Six Lesson School Teacher, which basically brings up a lot of points. So I recommend you read that. If, if uh, he he used to be a school teacher and then he turned on the whole school system because he he, he found out what it was really all about. And it's not educating children; it's more about making children comply. Um, so, you know, what, what's, what's the best thing to do in that case? The, obviously, the best bet would be to homeschool your children. Um, you know, obviously, you need to have the resources to homeschool your children. Uh, for example, my wife and I were both working when our children were born, and we made the decision uh, that that my wife would stay home and watch the kids and 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 homeschool them. So it's a sacrifice that had to be made, but luckily we, we had the ability and the capability to do it. Some people don't. Uh, but there's other types of schools out there, like Montessori schools, that are, are a little bit more free to, and give the, the, the children more of a, you know, child-led type learning. Um, so again, if you're going to homeschool, I also believe that the, the best way to do it would be an unschooling type of scenario or child-led learning, where basically it's basically what we do with our children. We introduce our children to different ideas and different topics and different things, and we let them ask the questions. We let them. Uh, try to find the answers for themselves. And we almost never give them the answers. We don't sit there and say, this is the question, this is the answer. They ask the questions and they find the answers. We just guide them on how to find the answers themselves. So now they're learning this, this critical skill of, of, of coming to a conclusion on their own instead of depending on somebody to give them an answer. So, you know, other things to take into consideration would be parenting. Uh, skills. You know, do you give your kids orders or demands to do something? You know, if you're, if you're telling your kids that you have to do this or else, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to take this away from you. I'm going to take this toy away from you. Or if you keep doing that, I'm going to spank you. You know, these are all, you know, horrible things that you're, you're teaching your kids because you're teaching them about authority instead of teaching them to make the proper decisions. So you're basically teaching them to be sneaky because they know that if you do something in front, of, if they do something in front of you, that they're going to get caught and get punished. So they're, instead of doing it in front of you, they're just going to do it behind your back and, and hope that they don't get caught. So, you know, the, the best way to do it is to teach them, give them options, uh, you know, let them determine what's right and wrong. Let them, you know, and, and your job is to just guide them. You know, I, I don't believe that you should ever yell at your kids, spank your kids, hit your kids. Put your kids in a, a punishment, um, take things away from your kids, because that's what the state does to us as a form of punishment or as a form of control. So it's 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 all the same way, and, and it basically teaches them to 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 blind blindly you know follow and 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 comply. You know, spanking of course also you know teaches that violence is a good thing. Violence gets results. You know, it, and and basically you're you know it, what happens if your child is hitting another child. And then you, you take your child and you say, you don't do that, and you spank them on, on, on the butt. You know, basically now you're telling them, don't hit, but I'm going to hit you. So it, it, it shows you, again, the, the different power classes where, you know, you're the parent, so you're, it's okay if you hit, but it's not okay if they hit. So that's basically the same thing in government, you know. I can walk around with a gun because I'm a police officer, but you can't walk around with a gun because you're just, a, you know, an average citizen. You know, it, it separates the classes and, and, and creates this whole this whole concept of that there's two sets of laws for two different sets of people. And that's what we see in society today. And is, is we want to get away from teaching our kids things like that. You know, the best way to, to, to practice parenting would be uh, peaceful parenting or the non-aggression principle. Um, you want to show your kids mutual respect because they are individuals. They obviously don't have the same cognitive abilities as, as, as an adult does, but they're learning that. So it's your job to guide them and teach them those cognitive uh, skills. Um, you know, no spanking again, no yelling. You know, if, 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 if there's ever a situation you want to you want to try to remove the child from the situation or redirect their attention to something else, um, you want to try to give them options. You know, instead of saying, you know, stop doing that, stop doing that, come up with something else and say, hey, how about you take a look at this? Isn't this fun? You know, kind of distract them and, and, and take their mind off of, of what they're what they're doing that's bad and have them do something that's a little bit, you know, more productive. You know, and, and again, just, just kind of, you know, treat them with respect, treat them, you know, as your peer instead of as your, your property. 
You know, explain explain things to them, talk to them, explain why it's not a good thing to do, not 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 a good reason to do this. Um, you know, and and that promotes independence. It promotes you know, it, it promotes free thinking. Um, you know, the biggest thing that we want to do is to uh, teach our kids to question everything. I tell my kids, even even me, your father, question. Don't just take my word for something. Question everything I tell you. You know, start thinking for yourself. Don't 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 take take my word for something. Find the answer yourself. If if you don't believe, you don't have to believe what I what I. I'm, I'm failable. I'm a human being. I'm wrong too, even though I'm your father. You know, but it you know question everything I I, I tell you to do. You know, I, I also uh, believe in that, that certain aspects of religion are also, uh, you know, another way that, 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 conf that makes kids conform. Um, basically, it's, if you look at a lot of things with religion, if you have, uh, you know, if I'm, I'm, I come from a strong Catholic family, so my parents are, are Catholic, and I was raised Catholic. Uh, so, and, and, and it pretty much follows suit everybody you talk to. If you're Catholic, it's because your parents were Catholic. And there's a reason for that. It's because they conditioned you into it, and they tell you to blindly obey and, and follow that. And eventually, when you get older, you may start to question it. But you have these things that are that are stuck in your head from when you're a kid. And when, I remember when I was a kid asking my parents uh, different questions. They, they used to tell me, don't ask those questions. You're not allowed to ask those questions. Uh, you know, basically, uh, you just have to believe. You have to have faith. And I don't believe that's good for any situation. I believe you have to question everything. Um, just believing blindly in something because because you're taught to is not the right way to go, even even with religion. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be practicing religion. Uh, I'm not against religion. I'm just saying that you should have a free thinking approach with your children. You should give them uh, you know different options and let them know what's out there and let them decide what they want to believe. Don't force your beliefs on them. And this 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 rule applies also to to uh, atheists as well. I myself am an atheist, you know, but I never tell my children there is no God. I tell my children that we, there's, some of us don't believe in, in, in gods, you know, some people believe in, in gods, other people don't, you know, so I basically uh, teach the same thing to my children. I tell them, you know, don't believe me, make up your own decision. I have my aunts and uncles and parents that are constantly talking with my children about God and going to church and things like that, and I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Let them talk all they want. You know, and, and uh, I don't push my beliefs on my, my My aunts and uncles and parents, they're used to just pushing their beliefs on everybody because that's what they were brought up with. You know, but when, when, when they come to me and start questioning, asking questions to me, I don't say, look, they're wrong. Just ignore what they're saying. They're crazy. You know, I basically tell them, look, everybody believes in different things, and you have to determine what you believe in. Do you, you know, you have to look at the facts. You have to look at the logic around it, and you have to make up. You have to come to your own conclusion. Don't just trust my word for it, and don't trust their word for it. Come to your own conclusion. You know, but there's a lot of different things about about you know about religion too that also forces kids to comply um, that you don't see a lot in in the different uh, atheist communities. Um, the one thing would be you know that you have to do good. If you don't do good, you're going to go to hell. You know, things like that. Different uh, you know religious punishment. You know, there's there's Parts in the Bible that say if, if you just misbehave, you know, take the kid out and stone him. I mean, it's in the Bible. So, I mean, there's different things about about religion that 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 force kids to comply and force kids not to be free thinkers. You know, so I, I think you need if you're gonna if you're gonna practice religion, you have to have an open mind about it and and uh, you know practice a free thinking approach to things. You know, so so basically, just in conclusion, it's it's you know. Everybody around us is, is, uh, is we're, I mean, we're surrounded by people who do nothing but comply. They don't think for themselves. Um, you know, you could, you could look at the, the, the political debates, and, you know, everybody listens to the talking heads on the, on the, the TV or the, or the radio, and, and, you know, they, they trust everything. I mean, we have, we have a currency in this, in this country that's, you know, paper money that's just, you know, printed out of thin air. And everybody, you know, nobody questions it. It's, it's just a few people in the liberty community that actually question it, you know, and, and it's, they just take it for granted. And, and this is the, this is, everything revolves around their money. It's their savings. It's what they use to buy things. It's what they get paid in. And, and nobody's concerned enough to say, hey, let's, you know, take a look at why we're using this, this paper stuff that has nothing behind it, you know. So, so it's, it's all, it all comes in place with, 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 with uh, 
you know, stepping outside of the box and thinking for yourself instead of just, just going with the flow, the way things are, uh, and basically just, you know, just following and complying with everything. You know, if, if, if we have these, these laws out there that are ridiculous, somebody going to jail, for example, for, for you know, growing marijuana in their house or something like that, you know, it's, it's, it's a plan. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous, and, and, and people need to come out and question it. And, you know, if we had a society as a whole that questioned everything, these, some of, most of these silly laws would never exist because people would be outraged about most of them. You know, the, the violence that's committed by the drug war is much more than the violence that's committed, that's, that's the, the violence and, uh, and deaths and everything that's, that's caused by drugs. So, you know, it, we need to get a free thinking society. We need to start with the children. We need to teach the children to be free thinkers. We need to, we need to uh, you know, they're our future. So we need to invest in them. We need to really work on them in, as far as making them free thinkers. We need to, we need to, if we want radical change in this world, that's how we have to do it. We have to get people out of this, this mindset of just complying with everything, obeying authority. We need children who know that they are responsible for themselves, that, that a, they own themselves. Nobody else owns them. Their parents don't own them. Nobody owns them. They own themselves. Um, you know, and, and we need people, we need, to, we, need, we need them to understand the, the principles of, uh, of the non-aggression principle. You know, the non-aggression principle, principle kind of, you know, covers everything. It covers war. It covers laws. It covers government. It covers so many things. It covers, you know, child care. You know, so many things. So, you know, we need to teach these things to our children if we want to have a better future. And I think that's the be one of the best places we can start it with the children. And that, that's pretty much all I have to say. So if anybody has any questions or comments. Yes. So, uh, you know, we're brainwashing believing we have to teach our children. School teachers have to teach us. Yep. Um, and you, I mean, I really admire what you're doing. Jim. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Really on. But have your children support this? Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, the, the, the question that this gentleman just uh, answered for those of you in the internet that, that, that aren't here, um, he basically just asked me if, 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 if my children has, have taught me anything. And, and they're constantly teaching me. I mean, I mean, the biggest thing that they're teaching me is to be a better person. Right. You know, I, I mean, I, I, never, I never really even thought about, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, such a peaceful person until I had them. Then I realized that I had to. I, ha I had to get out of the, the same uh, pattern that, that, was, that was handed down to me from my parents and grandparents. And, you know, so, I, you know, they woke me up. They gave me that, you know. There's so many different things. I mean, I started researching about vaccinations, which I never would have looked into before. Um, that, to me, was a huge issue. It, I learned so much about that because of them. And, and then there's also the, the, the simple stuff that you don't think of every day because, you know, like, like my daughter, she's five years old. She knows more about bees and more about the, 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 the phases of the moon than I ever learned in my entire life. And she's five years old. You know, so, so just, you know, just with her getting a little taste of something. That's, and this is all it took, was her learning, you know, looking at one book and finding out about the moon. You know, and, and once she looked at the moon, and she says, wow, this is amazing. I want to learn more about it. So basically, we guide her and show her how to find out more about it. We don't tell her about it because we don't even know most of it. Because I, I have a public school education, too, and a Catholic school education. But, I mean, it's all the same to me. You know, but, you know, she, she, she asks the question. She finds out the answers. We help her find the answers. So we're learning at the same time. So just within, within the past year, everything she's learned about keeping bees and, uh, and about the moon, it, I mean, it, I've learned so much more in the past year with my daughter than I probably did in the last four years of high school. Yeah? <laughs> anyway. Um, as far as uh, your child's well, well-being, welfare, and dangerous situations, yep. if there's something toxic or pathological or yeah. addictive, at what point is it appropriate to, to use force to protect them from something they might not understand. Um, I think there's better ways to do it than using force. For I mean, I mean, my kids are still young, so as far as addictive drugs or something like that, I'm not. Really or like a dirty needle. And yeah, or something like that. I, I will. I will. I, I guess. I, I guess you, some people would consider it force, but I will physically pick them up and move them out of the situation, and I will calmly tell them what what it is. It's on. It's on. I'll explain to them what it is. You know, and obviously you're not going to let them. You're not going to let them run into the street. 
you know, things like that. You're going to you're gonna stop them in, in their place, and then you're going to pull to the side. And you're not going to spank them and say, why did you run into the street? That's bad. You know, you, instead of doing that, you know, you sit and you talk to them, you explain to them. I mean, kids, kids have, you know, have a, uh, an ability to grasp things that people don't understand. They don't give them enough credit. You know, so I feel like, you know, you just need to, you just need to, you, if they're in a situation where they can really harm themselves, then obviously you have to remove them from the situation. That's the first thing. Remove them from the situation. Don't start yelling at them. Don't start hitting them. No, remove them from the situation and then talk to them about it and explain to them why it's such a dangerous situation. I'm sorry, you said he's more outgoing than the unschooled children? Yeah, how do you, since they're not in the public school with the African-Americans for their kids, how do you not teach them? Well, actually, when, when I look at school, it, it's an interesting question because I've, I've, I've had questions like that before, and uh, I've actually questioned it myself. I had the same question. There's a whole super question. What's that? Repeat the question. For oh, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, uh, what he's asking is uh, the, the difference between um, school kids and homeschooled kids or unschooled kids. And what he's asking is, is uh, he, he mentioned that his half brother, that his half brother went to school and was, you know, more socialized and, and better with with other kids than the the kids who were unschooled. Is that? Yeah, his little brother and sister were unschooled. Okay. So yeah, so his little his little brother and sister were unschooled, and they're a little a lot shyer and and more shy with other kids. So uh, basically, you know, it's, it's the whole socialization question. Um, and basically, you know, I had the same issues, but. I think it's a matter of how you choose to unschool your children, too. Um, you know, there, there's obviously people that can homeschool their, their, their kids and keep them locked in a, in, a, in a room all day, you know, but it's the same thing in school, in my opinion. You know, if you're sitting in a school with kids that are, first of all, you're, in a school you're segregated to kids that are all your same age. When does that ever happen in true society? Never. You know, so, so you do that, you segregate them, to, and you group them all up in, with kids that are all the same age as them. And you tell them you have, they have to sit down, they have to obey, they can't talk. There's no socialization there. That's not socialization. That's learning to comply and listen to your teacher tell you what you're doing. I mean, sure, you get a little bit of, of chit-chat in between changing classes and, and things like that, but that's not true socialization. If you want true socialization, do what we do with our kids when we homeschool. We take them on field trips. They're on three, four field trips a day with, with kids that, are, that range from three years old to 15 years old. And they all get along great. They all play with each other. They help each other. The ones who have already learned things are helping the younger ones to learn things that they learn. So they're now, now instead of just learning something in a test just to pass the test and then forget about it, what these kids are actually doing is they're actually learn, They're actually using what they learn to now help the other kids. So they're basically uh, strengthening what they learned in school or, or, or what they learned with their parents or what they learned at home. And they're strengthening it. So by, by teaching it, by helping the other kids to learn it, they keep it going so it doesn't just die off. Question. Yes. Uh, I you have five minutes left. Okay. You, you say that one of your rules is to tell your kids always to question everything. Absolutely. I don't mean to sound like a wise guy here, but have you ever questioned that rule? Oh, uh, yes, I have. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah. But uh, and, and the main reason for it is is that you know I do question everything. You know I read something on paper that's scientific and it's a fact or you know it could be a fact and I'll, I'll look at it and I'll say does that make sense and I, I might go and research it myself. You know but uh, I, I think it's important because you know if you don't question everything you know somebody just just because somebody has I mean what's right and what's wrong you know just because somebody has an, a label an expert label you know some a PhD or whatever. You know, it doesn't mean that they're right all the time. You know, they're, they're failable. We're human beings. We're failable. Things are not always the way they, they, they may seem. So if you fall into this into this uh, trap where you just believe people because they have this degree or because they have, have this label behind their name, then, you know, you're going to get suckered a lot. You know, so, so I feel like if, if you just question everything, you know, open your mind and, and look outside the box. You know, just because of the world we live in, is the way it is, and you grew up in it, and your parents grew up in it, and it's never changed, and it's always been the same. Doesn't mean you have to look at it that way. You know, question everything. Because the, the, the one thing I find hard, and the reason why I think this is important, is because as far as, as, far as parents are concerned, I think the biggest thing that parents have to do to, to, to start 
to start behaving like this is that they need to get out of their own things that they have drilled into their mind. And that's even harder than doing it with the kids. So, you know, a lot of times subconsciously, you might, you might think that you're being open-minded, but you have these things that are so embedded in you yep. for so many years that have been drilled into you, and, and you're, just, you're just following it, you don't even realize it. So a lot of times, the, the whole question everything thing, I'm constantly questioning what I do, constantly, because of that reason. You know, because I don't want to fall into that same trap of, you know, the, the, the indoctrination, and, you know, I, I want to be a free thinker, and I want my kids to be that way. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to say like that, what you were talking about with your kids, and yep. like how you're learning through them, um, about the, the basis of, Earth, of uh, the moon and, um, and the ecology, like, yep. like it's getting to like another level, like um, I've been beginning to explore the notion of um, doing like more elaborate research things, like you know, on some friends, and you know, why not children being a mutual, mutual aspect, a mutual, to be involved in uh, mutual participation, and research when, um, you know, as you're young, they're beginning to like investigate, um, you know, ecology. You know, like they, they, they can initiate interest in people, like adults within the community that don't know anything Absolutely. about that. And we can actually learn, and, and like they're, the, the fact that they are blank slates, that they don't have any pre preconceived knowledge and notion about this world, that's a big, valuable insight to our way yeah. of living. And that should be integrated in our whole thinking process. Absolutely, and I agree with you 100%. And they, they can be involved um, in, you know, like, they can be like a mutual ask, mutual participants. Yeah, absolutely. Research. I mean, yeah. some of the questions that they come up with, you know, and, and I'm sorry to, for everybody that's, that's not here, um, he basically said that, uh, you know, what about bringing kids into different types of uh, groups to, to, to learn and study things alongside of adults, um, you know, and, and kind of just have them all working together because, the kids are a blank slate. The kids don't have the, the preconceived notions that the adults do in their in their in their mind. So you know, I think it's a great point because you know, there's questions that a kid will ask that you know you'll never even think of because it's just such a simple question, but it but it means so much. And and then you'll say, wow, that really is a good question. You'll just have to stop back and say, wow, I would have never even thought of that question. And and they just like you said, they have the blank slate. It's it's just a completely open mind. So they they're not stuck with the preconceived notions that we are. So they're able to take that and, and just completely learn something, you know, that, that, that may never have been learned before. So yeah, I think it's a great point. I'm curious, um, I, I believe you live in New Jersey. What sort of um, restrictions are and requirements are imposed by the state that qualifies somebody to be able to homeschool their child and learn the curriculum for the education? Um, I, I don't know anything. Yeah, basically he asked me, uh, because I live in New Jersey, he was asking what the, what the laws are basically for homeschooling in, in New Jersey. Um, so to, to answer that question, uh, we, we moved from Pennsylvania. We were first living in Pennsylvania. And believe it or not, although Pennsylvania is a lot better than New Jersey on certain things like firearms and things like that, but New Jersey is, believe it or not, better than Pennsylvania. There's actually, there's actually no requirements whatsoever for homeschooling. Yeah, whereas, whereas in Pennsylvania, you do have to, I, I believe you have to submit uh, every, every quarter, you have to submit something to the school board and, 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 and you know, your curriculum and everything. Whereas in, in New Jersey, there's absolutely no restrictions at all. Um, basically, we let the kids guide us. Just, just like I was talking about, uh, you know, we, we introduce them to things like, like, like reading and writing. And if they're interested in learning how to read and write, then we'll, we'll help them along. We'll guide them. But my daughter is five years old, and she sits every day with a book practicing the words and, and, until she learns it herself. She's learning to read herself. We're not, I mean, we're helping her by guiding her, you know, and giving her the resources to do so. But we're not actually sitting down saying, A, B, these are the letters, these are the, you know, phonics and all that. She's learning it all by herself just by looking at the books. Yeah, it's great. Well... I'm out of time. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second Agoras Io Agora <laughs> Io Unconference. Live from beautiful downtown Valley Forge at the Valley Forge Beef and Ale. 
My name is Ken Crawchuk. I am your Master of Ceremonies for today. We have already heard a great number of speakers. This is part of the entire unconference where there are over 100 exciting libertarian speakers on a wide variety of topics on two different channels. And we've had our share today, and there's still more coming. Before we bring our next one up, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our sponsors. This has been brought to you by the ANCAP Entrepreneur Network. Center for a Stateless Society, Cop Block, Freedoms Phoenix, Free Team, Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, and WeWon'tFly.com. Thank you. And I have to say, you've been very good to me. I think that Freedoms Phoenix should come after Free Team. I went to Catholic school, what can I say? Our next speaker needs no introduction at all, so I'm not going to give him one. His name is Larkin Rose. I will give him an introduction. He is a prolific author, which is putting it mildly. A blogger, musician, podcast host, and entertainer, which again is putting it mildly. And he's a notable tax heretic, which is also putting it mildly. Man. <laughs> Larkin is a relentless advocate for total freedom. Among his books are The Most Dangerous Superstition, The Iron Web, How to Be a Successful Tyrant, and Kicking the Dragon. Larkin is also a man of deep thought and bold action, which goes without saying. Why am I saying it? He has been a featured speaker at numerous events in the Philadelphia area and across the country. He was here for our first unconference back in March. He's here again for our second one. Please join me in welcoming the inimical Larkin Rose! <laughs> The title of my talk today is Condoning Lawlessness in the debate about freedom. Lots and lots of people approach the, the idea that, okay, all those people out there, they believe what they've been taught. They went to school, they were taught to believe these things, they were taught to bow to government, they were taught to do what they were told. And we want to sort of nudge them in the direction of Maybe you should think more for yourself, and but we don't want to sound too extreme. And so many people out there, I hear them talking about, you know, we, we have to find common ground, we have to sound moderate, we have to sound reasonable, and often when people start pitching ideas of freedom, the response from people who have always gone with the flow and, and done, with, done whatever they're told and believed whatever they're told is, well, surely you're not condoning lawlessness. And at that point, most pro-freedom people go, no, 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 no. I'm not advocating anything illegal or, or, or breaking the law. Or we, we just want the laws changed. And, and we think it would be better if we were taxed less. And I'm here to tell you that is the wrong answer. And here's why. Here's why it's the wrong answer. Between being a slave and being a free human being, there is a paradigm shift. Now, imagine you're a couple hundred years ago, and you're one of those wacko freak kooks who thinks slavery is bad. The rest of the world seems just fine with it. Hey, we've done it forever, and everybody else is doing it, and uh, what's the big, big deal? Well, we don't see a problem. The two approaches you could use are... Well, we're not really against slavery. We just want you to hit them not quite as hard and make them not work quite as many hours. No. The proper response is number two. Slavery is evil. Stop it. <laughs> now, based on personality, back then, a couple hundred years ago, all those radical abolitionists saying, this is wrong, this is evil, stop it. Some of them would say, but to be moral, you have to get to stop it. You have to point out the immorality of it. And so condone attacking innocent people and stealing their stuff and, and hurting people. But this is a distinction most people in the world can't make. Now, for those of us who have overcome the cult of statism, the indoctrination we went through, the distinction is so obvious that we think, how did we ever mush the two together? The concept of obedience and the concept of right and wrong. And of course, the reason they were mushed together 
is what Rob was talking about. We were taught that good equals obedience and obedience equals good. So most people literally cannot comprehend the idea that the good thing to do is disobey authority. But in most cases, the good thing to do is disobey authority. Now, Rob mentioned that if you, when you train your kids to bow to authority and do what they're told, you're training them into a life where they are going to be hurt. Whether they're young or middle-aged or older, they're going to be oppressed and controlled by people who like power. But there's another aspect I want to throw in. They're going to hurt others. If you teach your children to obey authority, they are going to be destroyers and thieves. And if you don't believe me, look up the name Stanley Milgram and look up the psychology he experiment, uh, psychology experiments he did on average normal Americans, and you will see the average normal American, if told to inflict horrible pain on an innocent stranger, will do it if he thinks authority told him to. So not only is training them into authority going to hurt them, it's going to hurt everybody else too. Now this is a, this is a tough paradigm shift for people to go through. Um, there's a lot of people in the freedom movement who still haven't gone through it. When I went through it, because I was a devout statist many years ago, and it was libertarian leaning and conservative leaning, but it was still status. And that last step is the hardest step because it's a complete change of paradigm. There is a smaller difference between I want 99% taxation and I want 1% taxation and I want 1% and I want none. Because that last step throws the whole notion of legitimate robbery away. As long as we're bickering over the number, we can all comfortably sit inside the paradigm that well, of course government's legitimate, and of course laws are, should be obeyed, and of course taxation is legitimate, and of course, of course, of course, they're a legitimate ruling class, and what they say is law, and we can wind that laws change, but we have to obey. Now let's just bicker about how much of our money they should steal, and how many aspects of our lives they should forcibly control. That entire conversation is utterly worthless. It doesn't get anywhere because it stays inside the paradigm of slave mentality. It stays inside the paradigm that we are beholden to the masters in D.C. or the state capitals or the local boneheads or whoever puts upon himself the label of authority and claims the right to rule. Now, I realize that when people want to win other people over, they tend to refrain from just slapping them in the face philosophically and saying the entire foundation of your whole belief system is completely bogus and insane. But I have found that no matter how gently you try to walk up to that line, eventually people freak out anyway. So I don't tiptoe up, up to them anymore, trying to sneak up on them. I just say, the basis of your entire belief system is totally bogus. <laughs> and people don't react well to that. I don't I didn't react well to that. But to break out of a paradigm, they have to see the possibility of a different paradigm. No matter how much they scream about it, no matter how much it scares them to death, and they go, oh, we can't have that. They have to be introduced to a fundamentally different idea. For example, condoning lawlessness. If you can cheat on your taxes and get away with it, do it. Because you can't cheat on your taxes any more than you can cheat a carjacker. <laughs> It is philosophically impossible to cheat someone out of something that was never theirs and they never had a right to. But that is a fundamental shift in paradigm to have people realize it's not just that the amount they rob us should change a little bit. It's that they're just people. And this, as obvious and simple as it sounds, is something most people don't comprehend. The, the crooks in D.C. who you see on CNN all the time who wear suits and use big pompous words and never actually say anything true, they're people. They're not gods. They have the exact same rights that you do. If you can't tax them, they can't tax you. Now, that sounds so simple and obvious to people who have broken out of the status paradigm, 
But to everyone else, it sounds like, well, no, we need them. We get to society collapses if we don't have some form of political. And they go into these excuses why the people we see on CNN have rights that we don't. Like, well, that's a nifty trick. How did they do that? I want a few extra rights. How do I get them? Like, it would be really handy if I had the moral right to rob other people, right? The moral, moral right to punch people out that I didn't like, even if they didn't do me harm. That would be cool. How do you get them? People don't want to question the foundation of their beliefs. But I think if we try to tiptoe up to it, eventually when they see where the conversation is going, they're just going to freak out anyway. So I believe we have to start at the thing that freaks them out. Because if they're ever going to let go of their mental enslavement, they have to look at the foundation. And you don't ever get there in the mainstream discussion of politics. If the discussion is, in what way should they rule us, you lost. The answer doesn't even matter. You already lost. You got the question wrong. If the question is, how much of what we produce should they forcibly confiscate us from us without our consent, you already lost because you got the question wrong. If you back up to the question, why on earth do we think they have the right to take what we earn without our consent? That's the question that matters. And the thing is, most people, when they get introduced to a question like that, or any of the other questions that, that make the entire mythology around government fall apart, um, one of my favorites is, can you delegate a right you don't have? And everybody says, well, no. Like, if I don't have the right to steal from you, I can't give someone else the right to steal from you. And everyone says, well, obviously. Hmm, how do the people in Congress get all their magical rights to tax and regulate? It wasn't from people, because people can't give it to them. It's from a mythical entity called government. But when you get people to start to look at these questions, invariably, and this was the case with me, they respond negatively, and their brains, instead of thinking and being rational, they go into these weird convoluted conniption fits to try to explain why what they believe their whole life isn't completely insane, even though it is. But it's worth making them do that anyway. Just like I am so glad that various people like Sandra Spooner, Frederick Bastia, um, lots of people who didn't die lots of years ago, said things that totally philosophically smacked me in the head when I was a statist. And my immediate response was, no, we have to have some sort of government because otherwise there would be chaos and there, it just, we just need legitimate government, limited blah, 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 blah. Because if nobody ever exposes anybody to that new paradigm, they can't get there. When you expose them to it for the first time, they'll probably freak out. I did. Everyone I know did. But if you get that seed inside their head, sometime later, weeks later, when they're done screaming and hollering, and they think, how did Congress get the right to take my money? Once the seed is in there, and I've, I've talked to lots and lots of people who were statists and are now anarchists or voluntarists, of the less scary sounding term, um, who went through this deprogramming, and it really is a deprogramming, because the belief in government is a religious faith. There is nothing rational about it. And when I was a statist, I would have insisted, no, it makes perfect sense, and I can lay it all out for you. No, it's a religious faith in a supernatural entity called government. There is no such thing. Because without authority, without the right to rule, it's not a government anymore, it's just a gang of thugs. And when the people recognize that it's just a gang of thugs, yeah, they have pretty many people who will hurt people on their behalf, so you can't just disobey them and expect nothing to happen. But once you recognize that they're a bunch of thugs, your behavior and attitude changes completely. This achieving freedom, there's, there's two obvious steps. One is getting people to be free inside their own head. And the second is, well, how do we actually live free in this world? Now, the more people get free inside their own head, the easier number two is. If everybody tomorrow woke up and say, Congress is just people. Their commands aren't laws. They're just threats. They're just bullies and crooks. Let's ignore them. Keep in mind that their enforcers are people too. If they woke up one day and said, wait, why am I robbing these people? IRS agent wakes up one day and says, why am I just swiping these people bank accounts because some people in Washington told me to. I'm not going to do that anymore. 
the entire power structure is 100% based on the illusion that there can be authority. It's all illusion. Yeah, the tanks are real and the guns are real and all this big nasty stuff is real. The only reason anybody does anything with them is because they were duped into believing in authority first. And they go out and righteously crush people who resist the commands of their gods. So we have to get people to look at the underlying paradigm, even if they react negatively and freak out and call you names. Oh, you're an extremist. Well, yeah, if the accept acceptable range of discussion in mainstream America is what level of slavery we should have. Yeah, I'm an extremist because I say none. Zero. At all. That's extreme. I know. And I don't apologize for it. Another thing is so many people I know um, who are working hard and really would rather be a lot more free. When somebody says, are you anti-government? No, no, no. We're just, we want better government. We want limited government. I'm anti-government. <laughs> because government, by its nature, is anti-human. It cannot be productive. It cannot be legitimate. It cannot be good. Now, every once in a while, I hear somebody say, well, if we just had government protect our rights and do nothing else, I said, that would be swell. It just wouldn't be government. <laughs> so... If you want to call the guy with the ice cream stand on the corner government, okay, have at it. But what government really is, is the group that claims the right to initiate violence and control everybody else. There is no such thing. And the belief that there can be such a thing is the entire problem. And the training, going back to what Rob was saying, the training into authority worship is the entire problem. The problem does not exist in Washington, D.C. or in the state capitals. The only reason those people have any power, any control at all, is because their victims imagine what they do to be legitimate. Because they have been taught that there is such a thing as the guy who has the right to forcibly control you. And they're taught that by most parents, just about all parents, except for all and me. And by all the schools, day in and day out. Forget reading, writing, and arithmetic and the things that, that schools pretend to teach. There's an excellent South Park episode about motorcycle riders. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it without your kids. Um, <laughs> sorry. But... When people are trained into the authoritarian mindset and trained to believe somebody has the right to control them, that is the whole problem. And breaking them out of that requires digging down underneath all of the beliefs that are conscious. Because people don't consciously sit down and think, you know, I've reasoned it out and I believe that Barack Obama has the moral right to forcibly control my life. Nobody figures that out rationally. It's something that was smashed into their head. He is not a human being. He is the President of the United States. What we freaking do? <laughs> he is a human being. Not just barely. He's not a good human being. He's a dishonest crook. He's a human being, and that's it. It doesn't matter how fancy their rituals are. It doesn't matter how, how grandiose their buildings are. They're people, and that's it. They have the exact... Oh, Barack Obama has the exact same rights that you do, and no more. And that is such a huge paradigm shift to what everyone has been taught that I, I think I know one person who had no trouble jumping the paradigm. Um, and I think that's true of, of younger people who haven't been indoctrinated this long. And a guy I met in prison seemed to have very little trouble going from, yeah, that's bogus, and he was there for a nonviolent victimless crime, which isn't a crime. And he had very little trouble letting go of the belief in authority. So he's like the one exception I can think of. Everybody else, myself included, will kick and scream and huff and puff. So you might as well just start out by making them kick and scream and huff and puff. And <laughs> introduce them to the fundamental paradigm shift that all the huffing and puffing in Washington, all their rituals, it's nothing. It's a joke. It's a pseudo-religious cult ritual that's supposed to convince you 
that you have an obligation to obey them. You don't. <laughs> they call it law. It's not law. It's a bunch of politicians telling you what to do. They call it taxation. It's not taxation. It's extortion. Um, there's a great article, and I forget the guy's name, so I should smack myself for that, but I won't initiate violence against myself. Um, <laughs> about slave speak that I read years and years ago, where we have to make sure that we're not repeating the terminology. We're not talking and thinking the way a slave talks and thinks. We don't talk about the master. We talk about that crook who's keeping us captive. We don't say laws. What Congress says, they're not laws. They're commands. You don't revere them like they're, they're you know, gospel from on high. They're commands of a bunch of crooks. And as troubling and scary as it is for most people to hear this, they have to hear it or they're never going to break out of the paradigm. They're never going to break out of mental enslavement unless somebody says to them, you have no obligation to obey the law. You have an obligation to refrain from murdering and stealing and doing bad things that hurt people. But all the garbage that spews out of Washington, you have no obligation whatsoever to obey a shred of it. And to come right out and say, I condone lawlessness, imagine what that sounds like to most people because they don't know what it means. They think that means you condone evil. No, the exact opposite. The initiation of violence is evil. And that is 99% of what government does. And it doesn't matter how many rituals and how much terminology they try to hide it under. If you... Talk out! <laughs> Sorry about that. What book is that? This is the very last page of The Most Dangerous Superstition, so I'm going to give you the punchline. Spoiler. 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 Well, it's not, it's not the novel, so it doesn't matter what happens. If you love death and destruction, oppression and suffering, injustice and violence, repression and torture, helplessness and despair, perpetual conflict and bloodshed, then teach your children to respect authority. Yeah. <laughs> and teach them that obedience is a virtue. If, on the other hand, you value peaceful coexistence, compassion and cooperation, freedom and justice, then teach your children the principles of self-ownership. Teach them to respect the rights of every human being and teach them to recognize and reject the belief in authority for what it is. The most irrational, self-contradictory, anti-human, evil, destructive and dangerous superstition the world has ever known. <laughs> So, who wants to tell me how to do that? <laughs> uh, I don't know about the contemporary person you're referring to, but Nietzsche even mentioned about slave morality versus national morality. So maybe it's linked to that a bit. Yeah, it, that, that one, he wasn't the one I was thinking of, although there's a great Nietzsche quote of um, the state is the coldest of all cold monsters, and from its mouth this lie rolls out I, the state, and the people. So I like that about Nietzsche. So uh, you mentioned Milgram, and I guess there were other experiments just about authority and the psychology of it. Um, and while I, I guess personally I would find that reprehensible to defer authority to, defer your own responsibility to an authority, isn't the alternative uh, other people defer responsibility to mobs? So what, what mechanism is there against um, like group mob mentality you know, to give up personal responsibility and conduct. Giving up the authority myth is no guarantee that individuals won't still be stupid and violent. However, if you compare the level of stupidity and violence that is done by way of the state to that which is done by way of um, just personal malice and stupidity, it's not even close. And here, here's my um, standard answer. There are three or 200 million people in this country who advocate that I be forcibly robbed under threat of being put in a cage, which I have been, if I don't give money to Congress. Are there 200 million people in this country who on their own 
would rob me. I don't think so. So I think the problem of how do we deal with individuals who are short-sighted and violent stupid, how do we defend ourselves from them, to me that is it will be an important problem when we get rid of authoritarianism. Until then, it is so dwarfed by legal extortion and murder and, and oppression that to me, it's sort of, you know, it's rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Let's get the thing afloat again, and then we can get to being like actually civilized people when it comes to our individual choices. So, um, I'll jump to him. Back what, what were you in prison for? Not sending pieces of paper to the government. Um, what it actually was, was I was saying too loudly things about the IRS and the income tax laws that they didn't want me to. The official charge was misdemeanor willful failure to file, as in not sending in piece of paper. Um, but it was because I was public and loud and invited them to prosecute me that might have had something to do with it. <laughs> um, and that whole story is unfortunately in the book that's out of print. But, uh, yeah, that was my fun adventure. That, that was after Freedom of the Paradise? Uh, yes. Yeah, I was interviewed with that. I think I, I may have already been indicted. <laughs> I forget. Um, but that was back there. Yeah, I, I did my years as a political prisoner. And it was only a year. And it was in one of those pretend prisons where there's nobody scary. Only a year. Only a year. Well, you know, look at all the people who've done a heck of a lot more than that. Besides, it gave me time to write some books. Yeah. Which I did. Oh, anybody here grab a book, grab a free book on the way out. They say that paying taxes is all about paying federal taxes. If you're going to spend a year in jail, why not just make it pay for this? Be, well, the, the reason I did it, now, this is the thing people ask me about. The, um, the reason I did it had nothing to do with the moral issue. Because if you say, I don't think I have any moral obligation to give you my money, and they say we don't care, go to prison. Um, my case actually revolved around what their laws actually say about it. Um, so I didn't want to hide, I didn't want to, the, the question was about why not expatriate. Um, I, I wanted to confront them on this. Um, and it's not because I had the slightest prayer that people in government or in the courts would do the right thing. It's because I had the slimmest little hope that one out of 12 supposedly randomly selected Americans would have enough of a brain to say, well, you didn't actually break the law. But they didn't, so I got to sit in the cage for a year and write some books. Um, but I wasn't, and I, I don't tell people, here, everybody do it, you know, even before I did it. I didn't say, everybody do this. I said, everybody don't do this, but watch and see if you can learn something about the way our justice system works, whether I win or lose. Um, hoping to win, but uh, there was actually a lot more to learn about the system um, by losing. So, hopefully somebody was paying attention to the right person. To be honest, to what Eric said, the majority of Yahweh should not be a citizen. They stay citizens. They don't pay any federal tax. They get passports. They get tried. So, you know, yeah, and if they can do that, again, th this is, uh, I'm not saying pay everybody do what I do. I'm saying hey, everybody don't. Um, if there's any way, either playing the tricks of the stupid game the politicians made up, or illegally just not getting robbed, have at it. You know, anything that makes people not get robbed is fine with me. Like a carjacker. If you outsmart him or punch him in the nose or run away, whatever makes it so he doesn't steal your car, that's morally just fine with me. Um, and that just, that wasn't what I was doing when I, when I did my... Yeah, I'm just thinking, again, like the Amish, they don't pay any federal taxes. The IRS doesn't bother with all I suspect if a few million people started doing that, they would come up with a new excuse to, to stop on people. Because they won't just, they're not at all even restricted by their own laws. They don't try to case you that 30 different times. When it comes right down to it, they don't care what their laws, what their rules say. They want their human livestock and they will do anything to keep them. Um, I think as long as the Amish are sort of this little group that, that isn't making that much money anyway, and they can sort of not worry about it, they wouldn't do anything. If 10 million people started doing it, they would change.